Hi everyone, are you able to hear me and see my screen clearly? Hi Abhinav, hi Balaji, hi Bintao, hi Gopi. Hello Kamal, Nirav, Noor, Tanmay and Pavan. All right, should we, uh, okay, let's wait for one more minute. All right, so let's start. All right, so great. So there are questions from, from uh, Gopi and Vinta. So Gopi's question is that um, there are three end-to-end -end, uh, projects. Do we submit the code? Uh, to reach us at CloudX Lab as well, or it, is it just a task to be done and mark as completed? So, so okay. Let me just uh, sh um, show you what we're talking about. All right, so what we have done is here in the, machine learning course, the Antoine project is there, right? And towards the end, we have these three projects. Okay. All right. So towards the end, there are these uh, three projects, estimate wine quality, forecast sales quantities, and product demand forecasting. Right, so these are largely uh, similar problems, similar to what we have discussed. And uh, they basically have mostly the regression and uh, we, we need to do these projects just the way we did the end-to-end -end project. Okay, we need to follow the, we need to follow, we need to follow the similar mechanism, the one that we followed in the class, splitting data, do the stratified um, test split, and then clean up the data, fill in the, uh, fill in the missing values and all of those steps that we followed in the class that we need to follow in these three projects. Okay. So, okay. And uh, you have to do at least one, at least one project out of these three. Okay. And, uh, Okay, submit your um, suggestions, uh, submit your, so the first step is that pick at least one project. Okay, submit your pick to reach us at CloudX Lab. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll basically 
connect the team together who are on the same project. Okay. Connect the team with the uh, with the same project together, and uh, once you are done, uh, let's take a timeline of uh, say around uh, fifteen days timeline, and uh, and the, at the end of it, we need to submit the we need to submit the. Uh, <coughs> Okay, submit two things. Um, submit number one, the, you have to timeline and to submit, you have to submit your Git repository. Okay. Okay. And uh, a Google Docs uh, report. Okay, whatever is your finding, everything. All right, so in today's time, why we uh, I'm suggesting a Git repository is because um, in your career, if you mention a repository uh, on your CV and the, the example is public, it generally helps you in your career. Along with that, along with that, it will become uh, easier, easier for the collaboration between all of them. Okay, so yeah. So in the machine learning course, uh, course in the uh, it's the fifteen days from uh, tomorrow. Okay, it's fifteen days from tomorrow. All right. Sounds okay. All right. So, uh, important part is that. Um, uh, you can e even team up uh, with uh, uh, my team members. Uh, we have Abhinav, Pratik, and Sharuk from my team. And uh, so, uh, except for me, you can team up with anybody, but I'll be, um, you know, um, connecting with all of you uh, during, the, during this project. So, we are doing this uh, in an opposite way. Generally, people do project at the end. We will have project at the end, but we want to do it in the beginning so that we uh, learn to struggle or learn to um, try the try various things from the beginning itself. Okay. Okay. All right. So All right. So you can pick the project or mark uh, uh you know mark okay or inform us that uh, don't need collabor collaboration, all right? Uh, or basically you have to g uh, help me with a couple of more things. Your time zone, um, you have to give me, okay, one is project, other is time zone or Okay. 
Okay. All right. So, yes. So you take your time or maybe, um, right? because you need to uh, review, the, review the project and uh, review the project. And you have to, uh, once you have uh, reviewed the project, pick the project and uh, suggest a time zone and uh, whether you need a collaboration or not, just let us know. Is there anything else? Um, okay is there anything that we would require all right so go through these uh, three projects there are three projects in the end-to-end -end project part in machine learning and uh, Yeah. All right, this is first one, then there is second one, there is third one. Okay. Great, great. All right, so there are a few questions, let me, um, so this was the answer to Answer to Gopi. All right, so. A question from uh, Noor is, uh, can you please send the link? And uh, I suggest if we can present the project as we discussed yesterday, if we can provide. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. In the, this project is very much on the lines as we have discussed in the class, okay? It's on the similar lines, these three projects. So almost similar lines. So you uh, take a pick and then the process is very similar, all right? Okay, and Nidav's question is, can you please share the team members list belongs to each project, okay? Yeah, this is what I'll do once you submit your suggestion. Okay, uh, all right. So question from Ross, option to work alone. Yes, you can uh, do that. But the next question is, should we improve the model as we come across more models? Yes. Okay, as we are learning more things during the session, if you feel that you can, uh, we can apply better models, then we can do that. Okay, a question from Gopi, maybe if we can do a Google doc, doc link during a break and people put their name against the project. Uh, I would say that you take your time, probably send the email by tomorrow, send the email with these uh, three information at least, and uh, maybe by tomorrow, so that you get enough time to look at the project and uh, get comfortable a question from noor how can we start on classification project if there is one if we don't know what is the process okay so uh, the process for most of it is going to be similar classification we are going to do today so you would be um, well equipped with handling uh, the end-to-end -end project it might if it might include classification also okay mostly these are not going to be classification one these three projects are mostly regression okay all right great great set of questions let me save this these notes today All right, great, great. So let's start with our discussion that we started yesterday. <clears throat> okay.
All right, so we have done an end-to-end -end project and we learned many things as we did that. We learned about statistical inference. We learned about many other aspects of, of doing an end-to-end -end machine learning project. And also, uh, if you any of you are planning to pick a project from, uh, say, Kaggle, feel free to do so. Okay, feel free to do so. Because my expectation is that uh, towards the end of the project, um, towards the end of the course, you should be ready for competing on Kaggle or, or taking up the real, real project, okay? And uh, since uh, most of you are doing very well uh, with respect to the, the assignments, and uh, so we would like to keep uh, the doors open for um, real life projects. And in case uh, somebody approaches us for, 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 for some of the industries generally keep on approaching us for their projects. So I would like to include uh, the team, okay, based on, based on the overall performance uh, because I need to see that commitment in order to involve them, okay? So that's a very important part for, for us. Okay. All right, great, great. So, so yesterday we started with the supervised learning and in the supervised learn, learning, so in the supervised learning, we are going to start with the regression for, uh, classification first, and then we will go ahead with the regression and other models. Okay, so, so the classification is very simple. When we have something that needs to be classified into one of the categories, we call it classification. Okay, if we had to um, predict the value, a decimal value or a number value or, or some other other predictions, in that case, we call it regression, okay? In classification, we basically put a label on it. And you'll find it very, in many cases, you'll find the boundary to be very thin. For example, identifying the number that it belongs to. At first, it would look as if it's a regression problem. Like, for example, if we're scanning the text and somebody has to predict what is written there, okay? At first it might look like regression because we are giving the number at the end of it, but here mostly the exercise is about putting one of the labels from zero to nine on a number, okay? So, so the, the, the exercise that we're going to do in this class is um, these two actually. First, uh, first, we will try to identify whether an image is a particular number or not. And then we will identify whether an image is zero, one, two, or up to nine, okay? So, all right, this we had talked about. So there are m many examples, like a spam filter is there, iris, uh, iris identification is there, and then credit card fraud, fraud detection is there, and then face recognition is there. So, so we are going to start with uh, classifying handwritten digits, all right? So there are two basic uh, classifications, binary and multi-class, all right? Binary means we want to say that something is um, X or not. All right, here, let's say given an image, we have to identify whether it's five or not five. This is called binary classification, okay? Multi-class classification is when we, we, we would be putting more than two classes, okay? Binary means there will be two classes. All right. So we, uh, we are going to use something called MNIST. MNIST is the hello world for the for the classification problems. And uh, basically these are 
digits handwritten by high school students and employees of US Census Bureau. Okay, so basically, uh, they collected a lot of uh, Im handwritten images from schools and and uh, organizations, and then put a proper label against every image, correctly identify image. Okay. All right. A question from Gopinath. The what? Uh, want to clarify my understanding? The iris that data set would be multi-class uh, classification. Yes. All right. So even the image recognition one is a multi-class one. So okay. So MNIST data set looks like the following. And um, let's take a look at the data. All right, this is where we were. So let me just go to the data set. All right. Uh, sorry. Okay. So, all right. So let's just start loading the data set. All right. So there is a method called fetch ML data. What it does is it downloads this data based on the name. This is the name of the MNIST original data. Okay. So here we are saying that. So here we are saying that import fetch ML data and then we are downloading or loading from the local okay if it has already downloaded it would not would not download it again and uh, it essentially downloads this data into your home directory at this location okay so let's do that Okay, so this is the MNIST data set. All right, and okay, so we can take a look at the terminal, so not here. So there should be, um, you can see that there is some folder got created with the name scikit data. And this is where, this is where the files is downloaded. Okay. And if you take a look at this, it looks like a binary data, right? So it's in a MATLAB format. Okay. And in the Unix, you could use uh, a command like file to check the format based on the magic a uh, number in the beginning of the file okay so so it's a matlab formatted data as in it's the data in the matlab format okay but um second line can load load most of uh, the, these formats very well all right so amnist when we are loading it it is a dictionary of these values, okay? It has the first key as column name and the column names are label and data. These are the two columns. And then this is the description. And this is the actual data. These are the handwritten images, okay? So this data, 
is an array. This is an array. And this array contains 70,000 rows. Okay, each of these rows are, each of these rows are uh, basically representation of the image. And how are we representing image? We are representing image by 784 pixels. Okay, so, so let's say this is the image, which is 28 pixel width and 28 pixel height. And the way we are representing it is by the way of 784 pixels. Uh, basically, we have taken each row pixel and put it in a single line. Okay, that's how it is represented. So we can we can convert these rows and present this data as if it's a image. All right. So let let me show you. So here we have. Okay. So question from Kamal, where is the data file? Basically data file is downloaded from the internet into your home directory, okay? And uh, is then loaded. If it is uh, already downloaded, then it would not download from, uh, from the internet again and would load it from your local folder. All right, so you can take a look at it here. It is downloaded in your home folder at this location. Okay, so you could say new terminal and you could go there and inside the terminal, you'll see scikit-learn data and scikit-learn data and then you will see ML data and there you will find it. Okay. Good. A question from Gopi. Can fetch ML data fetch any data file format? Um, there should be there should be some URLs. Let's just take a look at scikit-learn documentation. Okay. So you can see that uh, these are the various examples. Okay, so you have iris data, you have this data and so on, okay. Great. All right. So most of the libraries, whether R or scikit-learn or other libraries, they provide a quick way to download the commonly known data sets. Okay. So this is that that data set we're talking about. All right. So. So after loading this, uh, after picking the uh, particular data set from the dictionary, we get X and Y. So this is our data. This is going to be X and this is going to be Y. What is Y? Y is our target. Y contains numbers from zero to nine, while this data contains only zero and one. Okay, one means the pixel is on and zero means pixel is off. And that's how the image is composed. So it doesn't contain the grayscale. Uh, it doesn't contain intensity on every, every pixel. It just contains the zero or one. Okay, also it's a black and white image. 
All right, this is clear to everyone. Okay. Now let's take a look at it. So first we are importing the matplotlib, okay? And uh, the pi plot we are giving it as a name as PLT, because that's what we're going to use mostly, okay? And then we are saying here, okay, so the shape of Y is uh, 70,000 record, and the shape of X is 70,000 records, and 784 features, 784 columns. Okay, now next thing you're going to do is we're going to just pick any image. Okay, out of X, we got some digit. So this one is basically a digit having 784 values. Okay, so let me just remove this for time being and just display what's there in the sum digit some digit so some digit is you can see no it actually contains intensities yeah it actually contains intensities not zero and one all right all right so it it is a grayscale one it just contains the intensities at various points Okay, good, good. So, so some digit is basically a huge array of 784 characters. So if we convert this into, if we reshape it into a two dimensional array, right, then it'll look like this. Okay, let me just show you this. It will look more like this. Okay, still it's difficult to present. So what we're going to do is it's actually five. You can see this. Uh, if we have, uh, so, so it's basically like this. These are, these are the numbers and probably like this. Okay, so let's try to present it properly. Okay, so we're going to use image show, I am show. And this using this particular method and let's take a look at the plot. So you can see that it is well presented like a five. Okay. So the 36,000 record is five. And if we want to take a look at the label if it is labeled correctly, yes, it is labeled correctly. Similarly, you could try, okay. So we picked we picked the this particular record from X and uh, reshaped it into 28 by 28. And then we displayed it using I am show. Okay. All right. Let me try to answer to Noor. Actually, the image is yeah, like some digit image. So you can see that somewhere it's 86, somewhere it's 131 and so on. So it's basically having the intensities of the letters. And that's what it is also showing here. You see that? 
these are the lower intensity digits. Okay, great, great. So I hope everybody is clear about the data set. So Y contains the proper labels and X contains the images. Okay, so what we'll do is we will learn based on X and then we we'll learn based on X and then uh, put, uh, we will learn based on X and Y and then try to predict uh, and test on the same data set. So we are going to split this data set into two parts and uh, based on one part, we are going to do the training. Based on the second part, we are going to do the test. Okay. All right. So everybody's uh, clear about the data set, right? Abhinav, Balaji, Bintao, Gopi, Kamal, Nirav, Noor, Pavan, Pratik, Ross, and Shahrukh and Tanmay. How does it predict the number when you split the data set? That's what we are going to discuss. Okay. Okay. All right. So take a look at this data. Have you opened this? Uh, everybody has opened, uh, uh, checked out this repository and opened end to end project. Oh, sorry, classification. Okay. Yes, it's a gray scale. It just, the, the number only represents intensity. Okay. So this amnest is basically a dictionary. It's a dictionary of Python. And uh, these are the column names and th these are the keys. And out of this, the interesting part are these two members. These are the two interesting keys for us. This one is images, and these are these one are numbers. So, how many records are there in target? Yes. How many records are there in target? This array has how many values? 70,000, right? And how many, what is the dimension of this data? How many rows and how many columns? Yes, we have assigned this to capital X and we have assigned this to capital small y. That's what we have done. Okay, so assign it and then try to check the shape of both of it and you will get an idea. Okay, so we are saying, or let me just make it a little more simpler. It looks, uh, okay. So the shape of X is uh, this much and the shape of Y is this much, okay? It is just a one dimensional array with 70,000 uh, values. This one is a two dimensional array with this S dimension. Okay, Gopi. So MNIST target is assigned to Y and MNIST data is assigned to capital X. A question from Gopi, without uh, looking at the shape, you won't be able to tell it's 70,000. Not really, you can actually do this. Um, so if you say length of Y, Okay, you will be able to see that, right? 
and uh, let's say length of x is also 70,000 and length of the first element of capital X is 784. Good. So get comfortable with the. Okay. All right, so, all right, so, okay, let me, let me clear it. So basically the, the number of elements in the, in the Y are 70,000 and just uh, to be very clear. So the way we define tuple, the way we define tuple in Python is by the way of, let's say, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, my tuple equals one comma two, right? This is how we define tuple in, in Python. So we, we could also say things like this. So when we are defining tuple with a single, single value, we generally put an extra comma, otherwise it considers it as a normal value, okay? Therefore, a proper representation for single value in tuple is this, and that's what that's why when we say y dot shape, and it's supposed to give the tuple, and therefore to give the tuple in a singular way, it's representing it in this way, okay? Was that your question, Kamal? And Ross? So it's basically a one-dimensional array. Y is a one-dimensional array. And uh, the it's not a two-dimensional array. That's why it does not bother to give us one in the other way, okay? We would have expected it to give us 70,000 comma one, but Y is a single dimension array, okay? That's why. Great, great set of questions. I'll just remove whatever changes I made. Okay, so an, a two-dimensional array in case of uh, Python is a array of arrays, okay? So capital X is array of arrays. So capital X contains 70,000 elements and each of the elements is another array and that's how it is represented, okay? So length of X is 70,000 and length of X zero is 784. Great. All right, is everybody able to display it like an image like this? Tanmay, Sharu, Cross, everyone, uh, are you able to represent it like this? Because it's important to get familiar with the data. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. And be very clear about the data. Otherwise, there will be confusions at later point of time. All right. Great, great. So the next thing we are going to do is we are going to break down the data into two parts, test and training, okay? So we are going to split the data into training set and testing set, and then we are going to train the model on the training set and evaluate the performance of the model on the test set. Okay, so the entire data set has 70,000 images. So training set, we are going to just pick, uh, say, 60,000 images and test as 10,000. And it's pretty straightforward. All we have to do is 
um, capital X starting from the beginning till 60,000, we are giving it to X train and, and, um, and X test is this after 60,000. And uh, then the Y train is basically from the beginning up to 60,000, but not including 60,000. And this one is from there. Okay, so I hope this is clear to everyone. Now, let me again go back here. So this is what we're doing here. And at the end of it, we should get this as a result. Okay. Clear. Now, next thing is we are going to shuffle it. Ideally, in the, in the cases of, uh, let's say, if you are working in production, or if you are given this problem and you have to solve it, you will follow the same steps. You will follow the same steps uh, as we had done in the previous uh, session, whereby we would shuffle the data and then split the data, okay? And uh, of course, visualize the data in order to understand how, how it is, um, how, how it is distributed and so on. Okay, so so here we got we, we are trying to again shuffle it and how we're shuffling it by generating a permutation and then passing the permutation as an argument here and that way we will get the shuffled data. So X train and Y train contains the shuffled data, while X test and Y test we are going to keep it aside. A uh, very good question, Kamal. Why a uh, simple sampling? No thoughts about a stratified sampling or cluster sampling. So we should ideally go that route, okay? And those are the questions we should ideally ask in any project, okay? And it just that in, in this case, since we are focusing a lot on classification, we are not, uh, we, we are trying to skip those parts. Okay, otherwise it'll take a long time for us to, to move ahead. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. Good, very good. Now, so these are the two data set that we have prepared after splitting and shuffling. Okay, now let's start the training. So the, we are going to use binary, classif binary classifier Binary or sometimes also called binomial classification is the task of classifying the elements into two groups on the basis of classification rule. So here, here you have an image uh, and we are trying to classify it as five or not five. So quickly, we are going to use something called SGD, SGD classifier which is a stochastic gradient descent classifier. All right, a question from Kamal, should we always have a fixed seed? Yes, we should generally have a fixed seed as per, uh, I mean, it could be, the seed could be anything, but having a seed generally is a better idea. All right, good. So we are going to use uh, a particular algorithm called stochastic gradient descent classifier. We're going to we're going to go into a little bit more details into the approach as we go ahead. All right. All right, there are a few questions. Let me answer a, a question from Ross. A note about stratification probably should look at representation of labeled data before worrying about it. Okay, um, yes, we should generally take a look at the data and see if uh, we need to, if we start seeing that there are, um, there is skewness in the data, then we should generally do the stratification, uh, stratified sampling, okay? Say for example, um, 
let's say, uh, for example, that um, there are very few images. Let's say this data was not linear, right? And when we are, uh, it's a very good question uh, from both of you, Kamal and uh, Ross. Um, what you need to do is let me talk about a bit about stratified sampling. Imagine that uh, the data set that we gathered, there were only few images related to nine. Okay. Only few images related to nine. And there were many images related to other letters. So ideally, what I would do is I would basically create stratas based on the target, based on the target, uh, or based on some other characteristic. And then based on that characteristic, then I will split it. Or, or I will basically create this data and then um, then pick the values. Okay, then basically do the stratified sampling or do the stratified test split. Okay. I hope that's clear. So because uh, we do not want to miss out on uh, lesser numbers. Okay. At the end of the day, training should be uni uniform with respect to nine or one or zero or something. Okay, that we need to, we can use that as a criteria for stratification. All right, I hope I'm making sense. And um, question from Kamal. All right, so that the training doesn't happen over, okay, yes. So, yeah, so yes, we should generally pick a seed and then uh, keep a fixed sample so that we don't overfit our, our model. Yeah, that's the right reason and yes. Uh, another question is how do you get output of the counts for each number output of the counts for each number in the in the labeled data okay in the labeled data so the way you can do is you can basically um, you can say that okay here you can create a true and false array Okay, the, you remember the way we did in pandas? We, let's say this or this, okay? We say Y train and or we could actually say hist of Y train. Okay, so we can actually use the histogram. There was a function called hist that we with which we could actually do that. Okay, so let me see if I could do, do it right. I think hist was Okay, there was np dot hist. But there was a function. It was part of data frame, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it's an umpire array. So, okay. So you'll have to maybe convert it to uh, data frame quickly and then do that and that way we can do the count all right so that is a quick answer uh, Bintao, i'll answer the stochastic soon okay question is why we reshaped 28 by 28 uh, because we just wanted to display it okay Be because we wanted to display it and that's why all right. Okay, so you can generally create 
where did we go here right so we could say pd dot data frame and we could say y train dot hist import pandas speedy okay all right so we could use that or yeah thank you saruk we could also do plt.hist for histogram all right thank thank you pratik and thank you saruk did that answer your question ross okay this is related to fixing the seed yes okay a question from gopi i think we create a boolean series to count it that also we can do that that's all that also we can do uh, basically we say y train equals equals let's say we want to find out find out how many of these are say one right so we create this boolean series and then we say y y underscore train okay and pass it okay so these many are ones and if we can find out how many of them are ones that's also possible you see that so these many are ones and these many are zeros okay for i in range i uh, would call uh, 0 to 10 we could say this all right so this is another way to find out the numbers of uh, the frequency of each of these numbers all right so there could be many ways and these are just a couple of ideas great all right oh i have actually all right so my scripts actually i'm i'm basically committing at the, uh, committing at the same place all right okay great all right so i hope that okay let 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 it be there i'll commit it later all right so that was quick exploration of our data set did i skip any question all right okay so we are going to use uh, something called sgd classifier stochastic gradient descent classifier and the way it works is uh, here what we are going to do is if our data is two dimensional if our data is two if if we just take two dimensions of the data one we put it on x axis other we put it on y axis and and we we plot the data like this and then we try to draw the line we try to draw the line and uh, this line has to be such that it is dividing the data dividing the data and making sure that all of the values are on one side all of the values belong to a particular class okay so so sgd classifier basically is based on an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent gradient descent is a strategy to optimize uh, optimize um, the the optimize searching for a particular value that is fitting our resulting one gradient descent as well as the stochastic gradient descent 
is kind of a generalized algorithm that is used to um, try out many kind of values okay we will go into more details in a while okay and the classifier based on the stochastic gradient descent is what it is doing is it's trying to draw all possible lines it's going to draw if you have let's say two classes class zero and class one and what it's going to do is it's going to draw all possible lines it will try this it'll try this it'll try this it'll, try, it'll keep on trying all possible lines such that such that the such that the distance the distance of this line from both sides of the data is maximum it needs to maximize the distance from both the sides yes okay so so the gradient descent is basically look for global minimum and not really msc not really msc but it could be anything it could it it needs to the, we define something called penalty and we define something called something called loss okay so basically gradient descent is trying to look for global minimum penalty okay the definition of penalty or the loss would be problem specific or or mm, the the kind of work that we are trying to do all right okay the other question is yeah the other question is uh, from uh, gopi is it essential or helpful to research the math of stochastic gradient to perform sgd classifier you'll notice that the math is not too much required in these cases and uh, you will be able to get through without the math okay and you'll be amazed at uh, the amount of work you will be able to do without even knowing what the algorithm is doing inside okay all right great so yes so based on the yes so based on something called a loss function we compute how how far is this line from a particular particular data point and then we we combine all these values to make sure that this line is kind of at a maximum distance from both the sides okay so that's what that's what we are going to do next so so sgd classifier is a plain stochastic gradient descent learning routine it supports different loss functions and penalties for classification okay we'll talk about penalties and classification soon so what it does is it uses a standardized uh, like the way we have a for loop right we could one way could have been one way could have been that we drew all possible lines separating these two two clusters of data we drew this one then we drew this one and so on so we one way could have been that we draw all possible lines right and and instead of instead of trying all possible lines we used a strategy called stochastic gradient descent this is basically the strategy whereby instead of drawing all possible lines we try to go in the direction which gives us which gives us quick results it's kind of little greedy that instead of uh, waiting for uh, instead of going for uh, all possibilities it tries to go in the direction which is giving the best result okay so so sgd classifier is capable of handling large data set and dealing with training instances independently it is well suited for online learning okay so basically we try to draw the line separating the two data 
right now since we are we are we are trying to classify the uh, values in two dimension in uh, we're trying to classify the values into into two classes right therefore we are trying to draw draw the line such that it is equidistant from both so we are trying to figure this out what will be that line and this line this line will be our model okay a question from Minta: should it be a straight line or how about a curve okay good question so here we are taking one pixel and one pixel okay so between between the we're going to draw this line in all dimensions okay in all possible dimensions that means it will be something called a hyperplane okay so so if you think about it we are thinking that one pixel on x-axis one pixel on y-axis right this is x-axis this is y-axis and then there'll be z-axis and then there'll be more axes so if you think about it it is going to be it is going to be far more complex and comprehensive than a curve okay and therefore 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 even drawing the straight line would do a very good job okay drawing the straight line would do a very good job and um, drawing the curve is yes that is something we we should do and can do but but that's going to be far more expensive okay and towards the end when we analyze the result you will notice that because we have taken the linear regression as uh, our you can say that the it's, it's kind of a uh, this whole mechanism is very similar to what we call linear regression where we draw the line that is going through all the points closely okay so there in in case of uh, linear regression we try to fit the line that that is closest to all the data while here we try to find that line which is which is at a maximum margin from both the sides okay so the the mechanism of trying all possible lines is here as well as is the regression right and uh, the only difference is in the in something called a loss function loss function is how do we define how do we define what we are trying to optimize okay that i'm going to cover in a in a few seconds in case it's not there then i will go into more details okay so all right so going even with the linear linear line straight line is good enough because here we are trying to draw such line against between all all of the pixels all 784 dimensions not only two dimensions okay a question from nirav could you explain if we have class two we'll talk about it soon when we talk about uh, multi uh, classifier the multi-class uh, classifier then we'll talk about this okay very good question Bintav. um okay a question from gopinath is it SGD? find the optimal line similar to analogy used uh, earlier yes that's right okay a question from Noor. so this is the plot of one image and each data point represent a pixel it's a point and basically this uh, image this image is it has two images okay say image one and image two Okay, it has two images and uh, having only two pixels. Okay, uh, say zeroth pixel and first pixel. Okay, that's what this image is. All right. So we basically, there are two features, one feature on x-axis, other feature on y-axis, class one and class two. Okay, 
there are two records that we are presenting here. Not actually, yeah, not two records. There are many records. Record one, record two, record three, record four, and so on. But two dimensions. I'm sorry. So yeah. So this one contains all kinds of all records. These are each data point is a record. While uh, the one feature is on x axis, other feature is on y axis. All right. And we are trying to draw a line such that it separates the two very well. Very good set of questions. OK, question is, which two features we select? For the visualization in this example, we have taken, we have taken the, say, we, we have just taken uh, for, for this image, just so that it looks really nice, we have taken a si simple image, right? And, and uh, and here, there are only first two features, but in, in reality, this line is going to be like a big plane because there will be a Z axis, there'll be, there are going to be 784 axes. And visualizing more than three dimensions on a paper is beyond our imagination, okay? So as per the di diagram, we are trying to just draw the line in two dimensions, but in reality, there are going to be 784 dimensions. Okay, because there are 784 features. Okay. Okay, and SDD, you, SDD will try all possible planes, all possible planes which will go through this, these 784 dimensions. All right. Yes. So you can say that first two, one or two pixels of the image are represented here. Say class one is um, image is five and class zero is image is not five, okay? Yes, okay. And uh, will it be a plane as in two dimension? Yes, will it will be a hyperplane in 784 dimensions. Okay, so you can say, say that in, in very simple words, that there will be such kind of graphs, 784 graphs, one again, uh, more than that actually, the n square graph, n, n square straight lines. Okay. Okay. A question from Kamal. So you split 3D into 2D, yes. And uh, so to split 784 dimensions, we will need a hyperplane of 783 dimensions. Mm, this is, um, the hyperplane will be of 784 dimensions. Okay, and if we want to basically even, let's say we want to present the graph of x, y, z in two dimensions. So what we have to do is x versus y, y versus z, and x versus z, right? So there will be three, three, gra three graphs of three dimensions. So it will be n into n minus one by two. Okay, not n minus one. Yes, that's right, Kamal. So if we try to uh, break it down uh, into into uh, on a uh, two dimensions, if n dimensions we want to draw, draw, first we'll have to draw first pixel, first pixel against second pixel, then first pixel against third pixel, and so on. That's how it look like. Okay, so 
if we had only two features if we had only two pixels in our image this is how it will look or if we had only say two dimensions x and y then this is how it will look okay A question from Ross, is this going to lead to the conclusion to use deep neural network to solve this? Not, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, it would, okay, okay, good question. So we'll try that, we'll try our standard mechanisms. SGD would give us a very good performance of 90 plus. And then we will leave with the point that to improve it further, we could go with uh, neural networks. Okay, and all right, all right. Let's let's go ahead. Okay, Th thank you, Gopi. It'll make more sense as I go ahead. All right. So, what does gradient descent do? Gradient descent basically tries to draw all possible lines through your data. So, uh, let me just. Uh, just uh, give you a little bit more perspective. So imagine that imagine that you have two classes of variable uh, things like the, this is uh, one class and this is another class. Okay, and things like that. So the, the most of this, these algorithms, all they do is they try to draw the line that is separating separating them very well. Okay. This one is separating and then they will try this one and the way they compute whether the previous line was good or this one is good by computing the maximum margin. Okay. Also, if this one went in the wrong direction, let's say, let's say we have, let's say we have this kind of, uh, this kind of line, right? So one class is this side, other class is th that side. And this one went on the other side. That means there will be a huge penalty for this. There will be a huge penalty or penalty for this. Okay. So this way, this way we draw all possible line to minimize minimize uh, this penalty and maximize this gap. Okay. Maximize the gap from both the sides. So it is going to try all possible such lines. This line. This line. This line. This line. This line. This line this line is going to try all possible lines uh, in, 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 in that way. Similarly, it's going to try for each of the slope. When we are just rotating it, we are just changing the slope. And for each of the slopes, it's going to try uh, the distance from the center. It's going to try all of these lines, okay? So now you can imagine that it's going to be uh, extremely huge time consuming process. So instead of that, what it does is, what it does is first it would try this, okay? Then it will change, say something, okay? And then it will see whether it's going good or bad. If it went bad, it will go in the opposite direction. It, if, if it went, uh, it uh, basically the distance is improving, then it will keep on going the, that direction. Similarly, it will also vary the slope Okay, it will also vary the slope. It will also vary the slope such that, such that, okay, such that, such that, uh, it will also vary the slope and then try to see if this, this went good or bad. Say, as per the numbers, if this is going good in this direction, or let's say it is here, okay? So here, first it tried the other side because more values came on this side and it, and one of them it came this side that means it's going bad so it will quickly start trying the other direction so so instead of trying instead of trying all possibility all possibilities it tries it, it starts going in the direction by comparing the last two values last two values or we by by comparing the rate of change by comparing the rate of change it uh, figures out which direction is giving good results and it starts going in that direction. Okay, so this is basically the SGD classifier. Okay, and a question from Noor, is it going to do it 783 times? Uh, it is hard to visualize, but it's actually pretty simple to uh, see that uh, that only it, it needs to 
just keep on changing 784 variables okay 784 or more, more than that a uh, little more than 784 into two variables these many variables in order to in order to fit this line okay so it will assume um, it will assume certain uh, slopes in every dimension sl slope and distance and then it will keep on varying those variables okay so this is going to do basically the whole hyperplane gets updated updated concurrently so is going to update the whole plane together okay so it's it's actually going doing this in all dimension at the same time all right i hope that makes sense to you did 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 this example make sense to you this one okay so yes all right so that's what it is going to do it's very simple the strategy is very simple this is standard gradient descent so imagine that you uh, yourself are blindfolded on the mountainous terrain and you have to find the best lowest point if your last step went higher you go to opposite direction otherwise you keep going in the same direction faster okay so all right so the way the way we do it is that we kind of uh, at every point at every point what we do is we compute something called a loss function okay what is a loss function in this case loss function is loss function is this distance the perpendicular distance from the line right multiplied with whether it's in the correct direction or not okay multiplied with whether it's in the correct direction or not okay so that's the loss function so loss function is loss function is something like this so loss equals um, what do you call see, uh, correct side let's say this i'm just putting it correct side into into the distance okay into the this is the loss function okay this is the loss function okay um, i mean it's a little bit more different than this uh, i will talk about that one this look uh, okay so distance from the hypothesis this is our hypothesis we call this hypothesis this is this line that goes through them is called hypothesis or we call it a plane and every point's distance is computed from this one okay okay so correct side as in uh, it's in the uh, uh, right side had it been had this been say like this okay so this one came on the wrong side okay this one came on the wrong side and loss is actually this way i'm sorry i'll just make it correct i think um yeah okay i'll, I'll correct this one okay so let me let me put it this way okay All right. So, what is it that we are trying to do? We are trying to maximize the maximize this distance distance of uh, values from the plane. Okay. And how are we going to do it? Basically, we are going to define something called a loss function. Okay. And loss function it looks like this: max of zero and zero and one minus y into y into the score 
Okay, so don't 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 zone out. I'll I'll correct it. Okay, so what is a loss? Loss means uh, something negative, and we want to minimize the loss. Okay, we want to minimize the loss. Okay, so here. Uh, the loss is a maximum of zero or one minus y score. That means if something is on the right, correct side and is good enough pl place, let it be good that way. Okay. So this is the the why, why is the whether something is on the correct side or not? The score is the distance from the line. Okay. So if something is on the wrong side, the loss is going to be big. Okay. So something is going to be on the wrong side. The loss is going to be big if let's say this is here okay then there is a loss he here okay if if it is here then the then it is uh, the the loss is not there okay so what we do is we compute the we compute these these errors okay we compute the we compute how much loss is there is there in every one? And the loss is basically a function of this distance. And if it is on the wrong side, the, it will be a huge loss, okay? And overall, what we do is we sum up this loss and try to minimize the loss. We try to minimize the loss, okay? And uh, yes, we minimize this uh, residual errors. So we try all uh, the SGD is going to try all possible such lines which have the minimum overall penalty. So penalty is summation of summation or some function of loss, and the, there is a penalty function which sums up all the losses. Okay. So score is a kind of the distance from the line. So and y means whether it's. Uh, uh, classified correctly or not. So let let me just show you something. So if let's say x, there is one x this side, right? There is one x this side. It has got some distance from here, but it is wrongly classified. So the loss is the loss is going to be uh, this. This is wrongly classified, so it's going to be minus one. Okay. So one plus uh, one plus the distance that is going to be the 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 loss okay so it's a positive value in the case of x it's a positive value and in case of all of these it's going to be uh, zero okay so this is how it is so basically internally the the internally the same thing is represented as uh, something yeah it's very much like uh, least squares regression okay so so in very simple words, all we are doing is we are trying to draw this line in, we are trying to draw this plane in all, in using all these variables and trying to minimize the loss. We'll just keep on going and then we'll, I'll show you. Okay, so this is what gradient descent do. Gradient descent, what it does is it tries to minimize the overall cost or global loss. Okay, so it tries to 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 minimize the global cost. Clock cost is nothing but the loss of against everything summed up together. Okay, and all it does is it tries to minimize it. Okay, so if if the slope is if uh, let's say at any point of time if the if the slope uh, Okay, if the rate of change is looking good, it is it will keep on going in that direction. If the rate of change is looking bad, it will go in the opposite direction. That's the simple gradient descent. Now, what is sto stochastic gradient descent? A very a very common question that uh, people ask is what is stochastic? In I will we will cover that in the next chapter. Okay, but let me just give you the brief. So gradient descent is general algorithm in which we in which we try to minimize the loss by going into the direction, which one, the direction which is giving us a good result. So 
what we do is we change the slope or the coefficient we change those parameters in a way that in, 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 we observe the change in those parameters and in case we are getting faster results we go in that direction but if we are doing that sometimes what happens is sometimes what happens is uh, when we are okay sometimes what happens is let's say this distance we need to compute this distance we need to compute on all the variables right all on the 70000 times this one is the loss is going to be computed 70000 times in our case or 60000 times sorry 60000 times because that's our so there are 60000 points on the plane right so we need to so every time we draw the line we're going to compute the distance from all the 60000 points okay and this way what would happen is it will consume a lot of time it will consume a lot of time so what it does is it basically the stochastic gradient descent what it does is instead of instead of computing the distance from all of the points what it does is it basically randomly picks one point and does the do, uh, computes the distance instead of 60000 okay and uh, and then keeps on moving then it keeps on moving the loss function okay it sounds strange that we are just co computing the distance from one point at a time instead of all of the points but it does work out after good enough iterations okay this is stochastic okay stochastic means uh, random and in the case of stochastic instead of computing the distance from all of the uh, numbers all of the values it just computes the distance from one randomly picked randomly picked value and then uh, takes the decision based on that Okay, this minimizes the number of iterations drastically and gives better result. It is a hidden trial method. Okay. All right. So basically, stochastic is to pick only few observations randomly and trying the distance instead of uh, computing the distance from all of this and then take a decision how does it know when to stop when the last two few errors start decreasing then it it can stop but in in most of these um, uh, in case of stochastic uh, gradient descent stopping is a big problem okay stopping is a big problem it's a good question you asked stopping is a big problem because um, uh, because it's picking up a single value randomly and there are high chances that you get you get wrong results and th that's why that's why some other methods are used like using a mini batch instead of doing only on one record in the mini batch you do uh, some randomly selected few values okay or with the stochastic gradient descent what we also do is we specify after how many iterations it's okay to stop all right so because there could be a scenario that it will it'll keep on going in the infinite loop all right so so i'll try to take you through a very very simple example that we can visualize with only two data points with two two features and then we will apply the same principle on the images okay so we're going to go with a very simple example of uh, two points with this uh, with the with the stochastic gradient descent and then we will apply the same principle on the images Okay, so Kamal's question is, but then if we stop with fewer iterations, then we may end up with not the right line. That's right, that's right. Okay, but though these are approximations and uh, some of the, the, these approximations do work out well. 
that's why general preferred way is using the minimum batch and and so on the the, the sgd seems to work pretty well in this case okay All right, so uh, let's take a break uh, for 10 minutes and we'll be right back. All right, so I'm, I'm back, should we start? Okay, so I'm back and uh, yes. All right, great, great. All right, so what we have learned so far is uh, the, the basics of, very basics of uh, what is going behind the scenes. We will go into more and more details. While the standard gradient descent was great in order to find the values, but gradient descent used to, uh, is uh, prone to the local minimum, meaning that it is started just finding the nearby one instead of um, minima uh, available somewhere else because it is starts going in the direction. So, so if you think about this, if there is a small pit here, you will just get into to that pit instead of the global minimum. That's why, that's why the gradient descent need to be um, a little bit modified with something called stochastic in which it picks up random, uh, random, uh, some other remote locations and we compare that compare that distance uh, how if there is some uh, if there is some other global minimum okay so that's stochastic and again let's just focus on practical funds and then anyway we are going to go into more details about gradient descent and the regression and other models in the next chapter okay the regression model that we have talked about uh, that we were talking about, so that, that we're going to do in the next session. A question from Bintao is that, uh, why is my script 03 underscore classification different from yours? Could you post the links for both the slides and the script? Okay, uh, um, let me just give you a copy of this one for now, and we will update in the project, uh, as in, I will update in the website, okay? So for now, let me just give you this and uh, okay. And let me see if, okay, let me see if this is, all right, so just give me a second. I will check with the GitHub. You would not require the. You would not require the access, okay? Because it is, uh, I think it is shared with everybody. Oh, anyone? Okay, yeah. Anyone with the link? For time being, that's a permission I have given. You can try that. All right. Is it accessible now? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, so this is, uh, and this one, I'm not sure. I think it is already updated, right? The classification, this one is what I'm talking about. Okay, this is the one I'm talking about. Okay, so you can do git pull, probably git pull, and then git checkout. All 
All right, going back to what we were discussing. All right. Okay, so let us try with a simple problem. So we will have two points, say 0, 0 and 1, 1. We'll plot the classifier along the training data set. <clears throat> and then once we are once we are um, done with training, then we will check which side two two is there. Okay. So here uh, this is the case. So so here first of all we are defining here. First of all, let me zoom it. Okay, so so we are importing pandas, then we are importing SGD classifier, and then we are defining x1. X1 has x1 has the x coordinates and y coordinates. Okay, and x3 is basically a data frame created out of x1. Okay and y is 0 and 1. So here we are saying that we are providing x3 in the argument here. So we are providing this data frame to SGD classifier, okay, so that it can learn from it. So it's going to, when, when we say learning, it's just figuring out where to draw the line, okay? So, so here we are saying that loss is hinge, and penalty is L2. L2 means root square, RMSI. And hinge means that it is the distance. Uh, it is hinge loss is basically the one that we were talking about to maximize the distance of the plane from the point. Okay, that is called hinge loss. Hinge loss means finding the uh, the the loss is equal to the the distance from the plane, distance from the, the, the line that we have drawn. So that is the loss, okay? The inverse of that one actually, okay? So in case of hinge loss, we maximize the distance between the two classes, okay? This, this is called hinge loss. And SGD classifier basically takes these two functions because SGD classifier can be used can be used in many cases for many kind of scenarios. And uh, since here we are trying to maximize the distance between the two classes, therefore we are passing the hinge loss and uh, penalty is L square because you want to compute the root mean square error. Okay, and then we are saying fit. Okay, so um, it is just a warning. We'll talk about this later. Okay. All right. So here you can pass the max iteration to SGD classifier as uh, as Penur that how after how many times it will stop, and that's exactly the warning is about. Since we have not set that default parameter, therefore it is uh, basically uh, considering thousand as the iteration. Okay. All right. So once it is done, it has uh, generated a line. Okay. It's called, uh, this is the coefficient and intercept. Remember the de definition of line where we used to call it. Yes, I'm going to visualize it soon. It is basically that MX plus C. So coefficient and intercept. So this is the, this is how it is looking like. Okay, now let's just take a look at this. So so when we are trying to plot it on the mat plot, this is how it looks. So here we are first of all saying import PLT. 
yeah and then we are saying plt dot plot x3 0 colon 1 okay 0 colon 1 as in from x3 from x3 we are uh, picking up both the records this and this okay and all right so both the records are plot done and then okay okay th this is where we have plotted these two points this and this okay this one will plot zero at record and this one will plot the first record and after that we are drawing a line we are drawing a line okay and here this this line is basically drawn drawn using the coefficient and intercept okay so this is the model that it had generated. Okay, this is the model that it had generated. Okay. <clears throat> so this is our resulting line as per SGD classifier. Good. Now, if you want to predict the values where the, on which side are they lying, we can use this. We can say CLF dot predict and we are passing two comma two comma two. So it is saying that it is on the it is on the one side as in the prediction side. Okay, let me go back a bit and explain to you again what we have done. On the y side, we had defined um, 0 and 1. On the x side, we have defined 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 1, right? So how it looks like in the diagram. And let me just... Uh, so what we are doing here, if you take a look at it closely, what we are trying to do here is we are saying 0, 0, and one one this is x and this is y this is zero and this is y that's what is happening here this is what we have done we this is basically this is our x3 okay all right so when we are saying two and two it is saying one all right it is saying the two and two belongs to one not zero. Okay. So if we say um, point one five and say point one five, what will happen? It belongs to zero. So one is the class and zero is the class. Yes. So these are the classes that we are classifying. This is our input data, and this is the class. So this input data belongs to zeroth class. This belongs to first class. And when we predicted, when we predicted, it came as uh, one. While when we predicted for uh, what was that number? 0 0.5, 0 0.5. When we predicted for 0.15 and 0.15, it came as zero. Okay. So you can see that this is basically the classification. Given certain data, classifying it into zero and one, this is binary classification. Okay. Okay, need some basic revision of, uh... okay. So this one is the first column, remember? Um, here, this is the first column. We have defined this as series means a column. This is another column. And we created data frame with two columns. So, so basically we created a dictionary. Using this dictionary, we created the data frame. Yeah, that's the heading. 
Good. All right. So we successfully are able to solve this very rudimentary case. Okay. I hope this is uh, this would make you comfortable with the the classifier. This is something we can do it with pen and paper as well. So. All right, everybody done with this? I have to go back up. Did we not define this? Okay, I think we missed some some of the statement. Yeah, this is the one we missed. All right. Okay, so try plotting it. That would, you will get a picture. Okay, so what he has done is he has changed this to five. Let's just try this. Okay. Okay. See that? So, All right, this is how it looks like, five and one. All right, so I think I can, I can, I can try it because I think we have put some constant here and there because of which the graph looks strange. So let, uh, let me try it. Uh, at, a, uh, at maybe at a later point of time. I'll, I'll do it the, the probably at a later point of time. Okay. All right. A question from Kamal. Uh, okay. And explain once what is x axis here? Okay. So. All right, so question here is that, um, what is X axis here? Okay, so we're plotting A and B. The A is this line and B is this. Okay, okay. So, so A is uh, zero, zero is first number. One, one is another number in our case, one, one, okay and that's the, those are the numbers and then one of them is considered x axis so as i was describing the as i was describing this is this is x axis this is y axis okay don't go with this name this is x axis x axis uh, from that perspective okay this is the class Got it. Okay. Okay, could you, yeah. So it is not five points that we are saying. Series uh, zero five means Series zero five. Uh, you have to put a 
स्क्वायर ब्रैकेट ओके जीरो फाइव मीन्स जीरो एंड फाइव ओके जीरो फाइव हियर इट डजेंट मीन दैट इज गोइंग टू बी ऑल द नंबर जनरेटेड फ्रॉम जीरो टू फाइव राइट आई शो यू वट इट मीन्स सो इफ आई से फाइव हियर ओके दिस मीन्स ओके यू कैन सी इट इज जीरो एंड फाइव All right, the the word series sounds like uh, it will generate the whole sequence, right? I forgot what uh, that term was. Okay, great, great. All right. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Gopi. All right. Now going back to our question. So let's try to convert our problem into into five no, or not five. Okay, that's what we are going to convert it into. Did we do this earlier? Yeah. All right. So. this is done this is done this is done okay now let's go back to the original problem okay let's go back to the original problem original problem was five and not five classifier right so instead of instead of identifying the images this uh, uh, instead of identifying all the images what we are going to focus first on identifying whether one image is five or not five okay and how do we translate our problem into that we will translate it by changing the value of y to zero and one okay we're going to change our our value so y train five is equals to this okay so what this is going to do this is what this is a huge array right this is a huge array of 60000 element every uh, member of this one is going to be compared with 5 wherever wherever it's equal to 5 it will become true otherwise it will become false okay so so if we take a look at uh, y train 5 it is a sequence of falses and trues okay and if i say 10000 here or say 1000 that's False. I think it starts from thirty-six thousand. Thirty-six thousand. Okay. Is it all full of? Uh... Okay. Okay. so all right no worry so it must have done it it's just that it's not visible to us 36000 okay so we'll have to find out will it do something oh there are okay there are all right great <coughs> okay so yeah thank you noor actually we had we had so shuffled the data earlier okay good now the next thing we are going to do is uh, once uh, so we have uh, we have created something called y train 5 okay and this y train 5 is basically x train remains the same just the y train has become instead of 
0 to 9, it has become true or false. It has become two values, true or false. All right, that's what it has become. And what we're doing, doing here is we are creating an instance of the classifier, STD classifier, and then we are fitting X and Y. This is the learning part of it. And then we are predicting, okay? So some digit that we are having here, okay? So is it there? Uh, did we define some digit somewhere? Okay, let me just see if we have. Okay, some, what is that some digit? Some digit is, okay, some digit is that five. All right, that we had assigned before shuffling. Okay, so here we are saying predict some digit. Okay, so based on this some digit, it's going to predict whether it's five or not five and it has given us true that means it has identified this particular digit pretty well okay pretty well so are you able to do it so we are saying as it classifier we instantiated it and then we trained it and then Yes, that's right, Kamal. That works for NDRA, but it also similar syntax also work uh, in case of the data frames also, I think. Okay. But there you have to do per column. Not in the regular array, that's right, that's right. The regular arrays of Python do not support that. If you have to, the closest to it in the normal Python is using the inline functions or using map. Using the map with inline functions. Okay. All right. Is it uh, clear? This particular syntax is clear to everybody? <clears throat> we are converting, yes, we are converting it as a bull, bi binary or Boolean a binomial uh, classification, binary or binomial classification by converting it to true and false instead of zero to nine. Done? <clears throat> okay now let's try to test it this one worked pretty well here uh, when we pass some digit it gave us true all right now let's understand that uh, let's understand it's uh, performance. Okay, let's try to understand its performance. Okay, so there are many performance methods uh, in case of um, in in case of uh, classification. So we are going to learn how to measure the accuracy and uh, recall. And there are quite a few metrics that we need to understand before measuring the performance. Okay. The first and uh, the the most simple one is testing using some sample data. Okay, that's the easiest one. So for that, it seems to be working. <clears throat> this one is just for sanity checks and not for any uh, true, per true um, examples. Okay, the, in the real way, 
we are we need to do something called cross validation accuracy and we are going to do a little bit more details into others okay so cross validation is the same as what we have a, a, a earlier studied it involves splitting the data set into k distinct subset called folds and then it trains and evaluates the model k times picking a different fold for evaluation every time and training on other k minus folds okay so the result is an array containing k evaluation scores this is exactly what we have learned so this is called this basically the the cross validation and so we can say here the cross well score and we are passing our classifier and then we are passing the x train and y train and uh, here we are passing the number of folds and here there is something called scoring equals accuracy okay so we are going to compare the accuracies remember earlier we computed the mean root mean square value here we are comparing the accuracy not root mean square value root mean square value was good root mean, root mean square value for was good for regression problems not for classification okay here in case of the in case of classification we generally used either accuracy or recall we're going to talk about accuracy and recall soon okay. so the general idea is to count the number of times instances of a are classified as b it can be better it can be better than simple accuracy okay so all right so the way it happens is uh, so the, first of all we compute something called confusion matrix this is called a confusion matrix on the x axis we on the on the rows we have actual and on the columns we have the predicted value something was neg positive there, there are two values negative and positive while it was predicted as positive so it became so this is called true positive if if a value is if value originally was positive and is predicted as positive we call it truly positive while if it is actually it was negative and it was predicted as positive then it call we call it false positive we call it false positive okay if the value originally was positive and it is classified as negative meaning positive so if we take an example of 5 not 5 so positive let's say we call positive as 5 and negative as not 5 so if something was 5 but it was classified as 5 then we call it true positive this is the best case okay similarly this is also the best best case if in case of negative okay these two are wrong if something was negative it's classified as positive or something was positive classified as negative these both are wrong all right so <clears throat> so this is the confusion matrix it's uh, the name is actually very apt because it's quite confusing at many points okay so so it should be confusing matrix instead of confusion matrix okay so so this is basically the general one okay and uh, yes so in our case in our case the, the if we you use the confusion matrix uh, what we will find is okay so this is where All right, I think this is something which we missed earlier. Okay, so Crosswell score, yeah. So Crosswell score, let's try to find it. Uh, okay, but then we'll compute the confusion matrix. Okay, so we are saying uh, Crosswell score is, and we are passing the algorithm name, then we are passing the train data set and so on. And the accuracy that it is giving is around 88 percent here it's 95 here it's 95 okay now 
This gives us the accuracy for all three folds, which is above 95%, which is good accuracy, right? How many of you think it's good? Yes. How much are you getting, Gopinath? All right. <clears throat> Probably you used a different uh, random number while shuffling. Okay. So here I'm getting around 95. Okay. All right, my random number was let me just see. Oh, I yeah, my random number was 42. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Did I mess up somewhere? Oh, now it's coming different. I think uh, we made some changes earlier. Okay, so yes, the accuracy is coming out to be really good, really good around 95%. Okay, now do you think it is good? How many of you think it's a good accuracy? All right, all right. Now let me ask you uh, another question, okay? Let me ask you another question. There was a random classifier. Imagine there was a random classifier which doesn't have any mind. It just, uh, it just uh, randomly classifies an image as five or not five, okay? So what will be accuracy of that one? If there was a random classifier, what will be the accuracy of that one? It doesn't do anything. It basically randomly classifies something as true or false. Yes? Balaji, Bintao. Let's say there was a random classifier which would uh, do, the, do it randomly. Like for example, this one, okay? So we have this never five classifier. Okay, so uh, instead of random, let's say there was uh, one that always says it's no. Let's say there's a classifier which always says no. What will be the accuracy of this classifier? Okay. And what is that approximately? Let's say all the records were equally for all zero to nine, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so Bintao's question is, are these values uh, precision recall. No, actually, they are the values for three different folds. We are using three folds. CV equals three. Okay. So if you have a never classifier, never five classifier, what will be the accuracy of that one? Anybody?
Kamal says it's 90%. I'll come back to that, Gopi. So my question to you is, let's say we designed uh, uh, something called never five classifier. It always gives no. It always returns zero. In that case, what will be the accuracy of this one? Tanmay, Sharuk. Ross, Pratik, Pavan, Noor, Neera, Kamal. Accuracy is basically how many records it's classifying well. That's right, Binta. So, okay, let me put it this way. So we, what we have done is we have converted uh, our problem into five, not five, right? And assume that there were out of 60,000, there were 6,000 records that are for five rest, rest, uh, rest of the records are for all other digits. Okay, so never five classifier is going to classify everything as not five. Okay, so what is the accuracy of never five classifier approximately? Yes, that's right, Gopi. And if they were all uh, kind of, uh, there were equal distribution of numbers, like uh, out of 60,000 records, there were equal zeros, uh, the total number of zeros, ones and twos and threes and fours and fives and six, there were equal amount of numbers, then the five will be approximately one tenth, right? Okay. So therefore, therefore, never five will get it right approximately 90% of the time because only 10% is 10% is five. So right now accuracy is uh, out of how many we got it uh, uh, out of how many total we got it classified correctly. Okay, so you can see that the accuracy of accuracy of never five classifier is going to be more than ninety percent. Thank you, Noor. Is going to be more than ninety percent. So hence, <clears throat> so so so. Hence, we need better measures of performance. So even though, even though we had really, really bad um, learning algorithm, we had really bad learning algorithm, still it gave us the accuracy as 90 plus, okay? So which is misleading, right? And hence we need a better measure of performance for our classifier. All right. A question from Minta, what is the formula for accuracy? Accuracy right now is how many, out of how many total it has classified how many correctly, okay? We will go into more details about F1 and uh, other, other details soon. A question from Kamal, how can I quickly um, see the count of fives in Y train five? The way I did was I had used um, a plt.hist, plt.hist function. 
Okay. Is everybody with me so far? All right. So Gopi, I do not want to spoil this notebook. So whatever changes I'm doing, I'm going to kind of discard those. Okay, I'm going to discard those. And yeah. All right. Okay. All right, should we move on? Okay, so basically what we just learned was, okay, Kamal, go ahead. Your question is how to, can I quickly count? Okay. All right. Okay, so um, remember the one that I had done above? Here. Yeah. You can see that? This is what I had done earlier. So in this, these were 5,421. Okay. All right. So a question is, if we say plt dot hist for uh, what was that? Y underscore train underscore five. Yes. All right. So I think here, this one is 5,421. Okay. And 54,579. These are the counts of various values. These are the counts of various values, and these are the other things. Okay. So it, it has basically plotted for zero and one. Okay. True became one, and false became zero. Yes. So these many zeros, these many ones, so that's approximately 10%. All right. So probably the by default, what his does is, is basically has something called buckets. Okay. And by default, it creates a bucket of size 0.1. All right. That's what it does. So this is basically values from 0.9 till one. This is from one to zero to point one. Good. All right, let's move on. Okay, so what we learned just now, what we learned just now was that even when the even when we were using not five classifier, we were getting the we, we were getting the wrong uh, we were getting a huge accuracy. We were getting a ninety percent accuracy. It is like saying that um, a stopped clock shows correct time at least for at least for two hours a day for for at least during two times a day. 
right in the similar way our never five classifier was right was right 90 percent of the time therefore one thing we need to fix is is our understanding of computing the accuracy our understanding of measuring the accuracy okay so this is where the confusion confusion matrix is created so we create something called this confusion matrix so we count we count our we represent the classes on one side these were the actual classes and predicted classes so and then we basically write the numbers in each boxes so here we have written not five which were classified correctly five that were classified correctly not five that were classified as five five that were classified as not five that's what we have done so this is false negative and this is false positive okay so this is called this is called the confusion matrix okay now So the first row of this matrix considers non five images negative class five 53,272 of them were correctly classified as not five. Okay, these are true negative and the remaining one zero one three zero seven were wrongly classified as five. These are false positives and And so on, right? One zero seven seven were wrongly classified as non fives, and uh, the remaining four three four four were correctly classified as fives. Okay. All right. So we can at any point of time we can generate the confusion matrix using using the confusion matrix formula. Okay, so let me also run the rest of them before. Okay, so I'm going to do run all above so here we have trained now we have trained our our uh, sg sg okay so here sgd classifier we have uh, trained with uh, uh, trained here and we have tested with the cross uh, cross well predict so cross well predict what it does is it basically gives the prediction after doing the cross validation okay so it combines both the things cross validation as well as the prediction and this is the predicted wise okay this is the predicted wise now using the predicted wise and the actual wise okay we can prepare the confusion matrix so this is our confusion matrix all right, this is our confusion matrix. So, all right, so we have prepared the confusion matrix. Now let's understand the further values of confusion matrix. Okay. So this diagram should be clear to all. So, where there were five, but but predicted as um, not five. These are those cases. These are false negative. Where it was five and predicted as five. This is those the cases where it was it was not five, but it was predicted as five. And here where it was not five and predicted as not five. In those cases now the way we define precision the way we define precision is true positive divided by true positive plus false positive okay 
this is how we define define precision okay out of total out of total um, positive values how many of them got predicted as predicted correctly that's how we define the precision precision means out of total predictions how many of them are correct out of total predictions how many of them are correct so this is called precision then there is another term that we use very frequently which is called recall recall means recall means out of true values out of really correct values how many of them were correctly identified okay so so precision uh, precision represents precision represents the okay so precision represents out of how many of true positive and false false positives true for positive and false positives meaning how many of total it predicted as five how many of total it predicted as five were actually five okay this is called precision okay so the more the more number of wrong fives it tags the precision goes low okay so out of out of total true positive true positive and false positive uh, meaning out of all the really uh, all out of all the predictions of five how many of them were truly five this is precision okay and recall is recall is true positive divided by true positive plus false negative true positive true positive plus false negative so true positive plus false negative meaning meaning out of uh, out of total number of re actual fives it was able to recall okay meaning recall you can um, think of recall as in the exam how much of it that you memorized you are able to recall in the same way out of all of the fives in the training data out of all of the files in the training data it is able to identify correctly how many of these okay so the more number of so so if the so so if the true positive is higher the the true positive is higher and uh, the the false negative is lower the the overall recall rate will be higher okay so so recall is about how many of it is is able to recall very well and precision is precision is about not making mistakes not making mistakes so out of the th that's why there is a in the downside the, this is in the denominator if it makes more mistakes if it makes more mistakes if it tags more values here that means precision will go down that means precision will go down and if it basically identifies very small very few as five then the recall rate will be will go down okay okay so recall is about recollecting what we learned instead recall is not about making mistakes a question from gopinath is why does recall ignore false positive does this mean that you should use both precision and recall together very good question i'm coming to that very soon uh, should not evaluate model based on precision or recall in, on its own yes that's right so we generally aim for either of the two precision or recall because generally when we increase precision the recall rate goes down okay the recall rate goes down so if you are trying to do uh, you know attempt all the questions in the exam the chances of you making mistake go high okay if you have negative marks then 
then you will go for precision. But if you don't have negative marks in the exam, then you might go for quick recall, right? Okay, so recall is all about um, all about being able to recall what we marked without caring about precision. So Kamal's question is, so no fives will recall of zero and all fives will have the precision of 100%. Okay, all fives will have 100% recall as well. Okay, so you have to notice that. All right, so precision means how many mistakes, uh, uh, how many correct values per total recognized. How we recognize a lot of them, okay? And out of them, only uh, few were really five, okay? So the, in that case, if there are too many of original values and only too few were, so we predicted a lot of, uh, so I think, I think I'll go ahead and you'll get the idea. So precision is about how many we predicted correctly divided by how many we pre totally predicted. So how many of them we predicted as five. So we are only talking about uh, predicting five here in case of precision. So how many of us, how many of the values we predicted as five, that's the den denominator. The numerator is how many of them were really five, okay? So my correct answers divided by my wrong plus correct answers, okay? That's precision. The recall rate is how many attempts, uh, how many did I attempt? As in how many, uh, how many were correct out of uh, total correct, okay? So again, so recall is about, recall is about how many of these I was able to recall out of the total, okay? And how many, this one is how many, so, and precision is about this divided by total we predicted, okay? So if we start predicting everything, uh, let me go back. So if we if we start predicting everything as uh, five, right? Everything is five. So if we start predicted predicting everything as five, what will happen is we out of out of total five, we have predicted these as five. So recall rate become will become more than more than uh, one. Okay, so if we predicted everything as five, everything as five, then the recall rate, this will be, uh, right? Th this will be 100% actually, okay? So if we start, the, if we just tag everything as five, the recall rate will become one, okay? The precision will be almost like zero. All right, good. Good, so let's go ahead. I hope this is clear to everybody. Okay, so out of this uh, matrix, um, yeah, confusion matrix, confusion matrix has these values and we can further compute the precision score we can further compute the precision score and recall score using these formulas, okay? So we can simply call these functions like this, okay? So precision score is this much and recall score is this much. Okay, now question is, uh, which one is good, precision or recall? Let's come back to that. Okay, so uh, 
all right let me let me just finish one more thing and then we'll go ahead all right so here the precision and recall that's what we have and all right so we have f1 score okay let me just go up this is good question from kamal is what is the precision for all five all five as in if uh, if we are uh, tagging everything as five yes if we are tagging everything as five then how many were really five that were um, there say 10 right and uh, and we predicted how many five we predicted how we predicted 100 as 5 correct that means 10% so you are right okay all right while recall rate will be 100% okay in this all five case Recall rate will be 100%. Yes, that's right. OK. So in case of no five, let's say we just return uh, return uh, false for everything. And uh, in that case, the recall as well precision, both will go zero. All right. Now, let's uh, understand why it matters. So there is another score called F1 score. Okay, F1 generally predicts how close are recall and precision to each other. Okay, so it's, it's kind of um, F1 represents how close the recall and precision are there uh, are closer to each other so that's why we the way we compute it is by saying one by precision plus one by recall okay so uh, two by it's basically harmonic mean of precision and re recall and this is how we compute that one by precision plus one by recall and all of it below two by all right so so F1 is also, uh, if we, if F1 is good, that means precision and recall are close to each other. Okay. Uh, Bintao's question is, is accuracy equals to true positive plus false negative divided by true positive plus true negative plus false positive? Yes. Yes. I think that's how the accuracy is defined. But accuracy, uh, we, we do not use accuracy too much. We generally use precision instead of accuracy. The word precision and accuracy is something which we use uh, interchangeably. All right. We're going to use precision as the key. Okay, so F1 score is basically for the cases where we want both precision and recall um, at the same time. Okay, and uh, yes. So we can compute F1 score in the simple way. Let me let me go back to a few more examples where we will learn we will learn about when to use what okay all right now coming back to coming back to your question so our whether we want to go with precision or recall it depends on what is it that we are trying to achieve so different cases may require different uh, measures of performance Okay, different cases may require different measures of performance. So 
let's say we want to detect our algorithm needs to detect whether a video is safe or unsafe for the kids okay okay where going wrong is is bad okay in the cases where going wrong is bad we go for precision okay we try to maximize the precision and if let's say we want to detect the shoplifters in in the surveillance images then then it, we we want to go for recall right it should be able to quickly detect the shoplifters in the surveillance images and then we can do the further analysis manually okay so in case of shoplifters shop, example we have a bandwidth we have a bandwidth there to to further improve it to further manually improve improve it or do something right in that case it's okay to tag the wrong images it's okay to tag more images as the shoplifters because we can uh, check it in detail while it's not okay to show to show the to show the unwholesome videos to the kids okay that's why in case of showing the safe videos to the kids we go for precisions okay and uh, in case of the situations like uh, detecting the uh, scanning the surveillance images for the shoplifters we go for recall okay it's okay to tag a wrong video a wrong video it's okay to tag a safe video as unsafe right but it's not okay to to tag a uh, unsafe video as safe for the kids all right i hope uh, you got the idea so it depends upon how much false positive is important to us yes so question from gopi is so you are saying we have a higher tolerance for precision in case of soft, soft lifters um as we are merely looking for detection with human intervention yes we have a uh, yeah we are okay with uh, let's say there are um there are a thousand images and we would like to quickly detect the shoplifters in those thousand images it's okay to tag somebody as shoplifter and then manually check if it is really a soft shoplifter okay and then do the scanning okay great i hope this example clears the our demand of precision and recall okay so in the case of yes so so let's say classification is done the basis of a score as calculated by decision function and score above a threshold is classified as false uh, as as positive class and score below a certain threshold is classified as negative class okay so what we are trying to show here is uh, let let's say our threshold we generally define our threshold okay so when we get the predictions when we get the predictions we can define a certain threshold to say that that this is our threshold below which we can't go okay so so if our threshold is here if our threshold is here the precision is how much precision is 6 by 8 6 by 8 out of all the eight images that it has identified 
six were actually six were actually uh, five, right? So it has incorrectly tagged two and six at five. So its accuracy is seventy-five percent. Okay. No, it wasn't a logistic regression. Okay. So yeah. So you will, I think, uh, these examples will. These things are generally uh, similar in many cases. Okay. Now. This is the precision and this is the recall. 100% is the so here right now the 100% recall because all of the fives have been identified. So no five was missed if the threshold was this much, but the precision was bad. But if we go with okay, if we go further, if the threshold is this much, if threshold is this much the accuracy improves you can see that out of five images that we have identified the four a four are the precise image okay and four by six is the recall rate now question to all of you is how much is precision and and recall if our threshold is this much anybody Precision is 100%? Okay, precision is 100% as per Kamal. And what about recall rate? Okay, anybody else? So as per Kamal and Noor, the recall rate is 50% and the precision is uh, 50%. Anybody else? F precision is 100%, recall rate is 50%. Anybody else? Tanmay? Okay. Good, 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 Balaji. And uh, great. So, yes. So, our precision is three divided by three plus zero because there is nothing wrong in them then. Okay. So question from Kamal is that why is three on this side while six is this side? All right, all right. So l this looks like, um, cooked up data okay we'll see at uh, real data soon okay all right so let me go down this side as well all right so Right, right. So this is how you your question is at the right time. This is how you you decide the threshold. So get the scores of all the training data set using cross well predict with there's something called decision function. And then compute the precision and recall for all possible threshold using precision recall curve. Plot both precision and recall for the threshold using matplot. Select the threshold value that gives the best precision recall best precision recall trade off to according to the task at hand all right so this is how basically we we plot precision and recall curve 
and uh, here uh, okay so this we've discussed yeah so what we do is we use decision function to give us the scores okay so it's giving us this much score for for y okay and then we can uh, put these conditions that if y score is greater than threshold then take this okay so we define the threshold here okay so also please note that while on one hand one hand the as, as we keep on increasing the threshold the, the the so this is the zero so as we as the precision grows or recall recall uh, sorry sorry as the precision is improved the recall rate drops down that's what we try to show here as as we try to decrease the threshold as as we as we as we try to increase the threshold the precision improved from 75 percent to 100 percent while recall rate dropped from 100 percent to 50 percent okay so all right so we'll continue from the 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 threshold part okay from the next session i hope uh, this was uh, useful all right so so we'll continue from here and do the do the further analysis of error in case of the in case of MNIST data and then we will we so first we will try to predict do the multi class then we will do the analysis of errors and we'll improve upon the improve upon the case all right great so this was a quick uh, quick uh, getting started with the classification feel free to experiment with all these values also get started with the project okay a question from gopi is so f1 score has a threshold too yes it's up to us okay all right so great so basically these are the scores and based on these scores we can define the threshold and the threshold is a function of our requirement of the project okay all right so see you next saturday have a good good week ahead thank you gopi i'm happy that you found it great all right. Thank you, Abhinav. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you, Bintao. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Nirav. Thank you, Noor, Bhavan, Pratik, Ross, and Sharuk, and Tanmay. Have a good day. Bye-bye.